and welcome to yet another lecture of Statistics 479 Time Series Analysis. Today we're going to be doing a bonus lecture. No more spectral methods. We're going to be looking at something called Holt Winters and Exponential Smoothing. It's going to be a good time. So in this lecture, we're going to look at first just a smoothing method, something that we talked about way back at the beginning of the course. But we're also going to look at how it relates to the ARIMA model, something that we've spent most of our lectures discussing. We're going to talk about different approaches to estimating and forecasting for this. Now, there's an entire textbooks about exponential smoothing. We're just going to scrape the surface, look at some examples, and try to get a sense of what it's doing just so you have that in the back of your knowledge in case you ever need to use it or you hear somebody talking about it and you want to kind of know what's going on. Now we're actually going to be looking at some R code. Specifically, we're going to look at the Alberta COVID cases and the Alberta COVID testing from last year. That is from uh, February to about August in 2020 during the first wave and the following summer. We're going to use these methods that are implemented in the Holt Winters function, which is in the stats package, and something called ETS, which is in the forecast package, which is not Edmonton Transit Services, though um, that also isn't so bad. Um, we're going to figure out how these functions work, and we're going to compare them to modeling with the ARIMA models, um, to fitting an ARIMA model to our data, as we've done throughout the rest of this course. Now again, there's so much more that you could do here and you could study, but hopefully this gives you a sense of what exponential smoothing is so you can go forward and read more about it on your own if you're so inclined. And with that, let's get back into the notes and see what this is all about. And welcome back to another lecture of Statistics 479 Time Series Analysis. Today we are on bonus material because we finished everything that I really wanted to cover in the course, or at least the things that I covered in the course last year when we were under the various uh, slowdowns that came with the onset of the COVID pandemic. Now that we have an extra two bonus lectures here, we can fill it in with some supplementary material that will certainly be interesting, I think, um, should you ever need to deal with time series data in practice. Today's topic will be on exponential smoothing and Holt Winters, and these are different way, a different approach to modeling and um, forecasting with time series. Now, I say a different approach because it kind of has a slightly different mindset involved, but we're going to find out that a lot of these methods are actually connected to certain ARIMA models that we've already seen when we have... Um, when we've seen earlier in the course. So we're going to do a, just a quick overview of some of these methods in uh, the notes, and then we'll move into our studio and I'll show you how some of the functions work. This is a very quick overview. There are entire textbooks on forecasting with exponential time series or exponential smoothing and things of that nature. So there's a lot more to this topic that we're not going to cover today. I'm just going to give you a brief overview, um, some interesting little tidbits that you can then use to go further into this subject if you are interested. So what's this all about? Well, let's get into the notes and find out. All right, so the first topic that I want to talk about is called simple exponential smoothing and this topic is one that we really could have covered way back at the beginning of the course when we talked about the moving average smoother so when we first introduced the idea of a moving average smoother what we said was that we're going to take some time series xt, and what we're going to do is we're going to create a new series st, where what we'll do is we'll, let's say, average some adjacent values like xt minus h plus xt plus x, or dot, 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 xt plus h, all divided by, in this case, I guess, 2h plus 1, 
if we have just a, um, a uniform average, right? Not a weighted average. In this case, we're just doing an, I guess, 2H plus one time unit moving average, right? So all I'm saying is this is something that we talked about way back at the beginning. I could just take a window, slide it along my time series and average the points that are within that window together to create a new smoother time series. Now, here we have the idea of a finite window but we could also do what's called exponential smoothing. And in this case, what we do is we create a new smooth method. So this is the moving average. If we wanted to do exponential smoothing, which is sometimes called simple exponential smoothing. There's a lot of terminology here and it can be a little confusing. You'll see like simple exponential smoothing, double exponential smoothing, linear exponential smoothing, Holt Winters smoothing uh, or Holt Winters, whatever. Um, there's a lot of different terminology. It can be a little confusing. So we'll try to make some sense of it, um, but yeah, <laughs> just to be aware of the fact that sometimes you see someone use one term when they actually mean something else. It doesn't seem like it's strictly well defined all of the definitions, but roughly if somebody says exponential or simple exponential smoothing, what they probably mean is doing something like this, which is taking, basically we define ST, um, which is our smoothed time series, to be, well, alpha times xt plus one minus alpha times st minus one. Um, and maybe we can say where, um, well, I guess we would just start this at say, yeah, we where s1, the starting point is just going to be x1. Okay, so what does this equation mean? Oh, and I should also say for some choice of alpha in zero, one. So what are we doing with this equation here? What we are doing here is this is a weighted average of the current point xt and the previous smoothed um, value st minus one. And here alpha is between zero and one. So if alpha would be one half, what I'm going to say is the new point that I'm estimating is going to be half the, um, or I'm smoothing, I guess, is going to be half the newly observed value and half the previous smoothed value. So in a sense, it's building in some inertia into the system. It's saying rather than just saying x1, x2, x3, x4, we're going to take those observed values, but we're going to have some aggregating average in ST that we're going to sum up here with a weighted weight depending on alpha. If alpha is equal to one, we just return the original series. There is no smoothing applied. If alpha is equal to zero, well, I guess in that case, we just return X1 all the way through and it's super boring. Um, but right, these are the two extremes. Um, and you'd have to choose alpha to decide exactly how you want to smooth. So then the question is, well, why in the world is this called exponential smoothing? Because I don't see an exponent anywhere in here. And what happens is if we actually iteratively um, write out this definition. So if we use this definition and we say that st is going to be alpha xt plus one minus alpha times and then what's st minus one? Well, it's going to be alpha x t minus one plus one minus alpha x, not x, s t minus two. Okay, so if we were to keep 
iterating this, what would we get? Well, what we would get is we would get a, a well, not an infinite series, a finite series, let's say um, something like the sum of j from, let's see if I get this right, zero to, I guess, well, t, let's see. Well, I'm going to write it out and I'm going to figure out what my exponent should be after the fact, right? What we're going to have here is we're going to have alpha times everything. And then we're going to start with an alpha, one minus alpha to the zero, one minus alpha to the one, one minus alpha squared, and so on. So this should be a, well, I guess just a j. And then we're going to have an x t minus j. And I guess we have to go all the way back to x is equal to, or x1, so j would have to go to t minus 1, something like that. Ah, except there's one subtlety, and that's what I had a feeling I was missing something. The final data point is not, multi or the, the, the initial data point x1 is not multiplied by alpha, because notice that alpha only comes in here and here it does not come in over here. So that means that the it's not really going to matter if alpha is, well, not really close to um, zero because, um, yeah, zero in this case, because um, what we would end up with is something like one minus alpha to the, I guess in this case, t minus one times x one. So this is why it's exponential smoothing, because it's basically, um, so this is effectively a weighted moving average smoother that uses the entire past because we're going all the way from our previous point all the way back into the past and we're in some sense dampening the influence of every subsequent past value by a factor of one minus alpha so as we go back again if alpha is closer to one then we don't rely as much on the past measurements if alpha is closer to zero then we're going to have a much smoother representation of our series so this is just a smoothing method um, that can be useful and one thing that i didn't mention in the spectral setting is that um, i'm going to say note smoothing acts as a what's called low pass filter. So if you've done any like signals processing or signals engineering, you might have heard of low pass filter. Effectively, a low pass filter is something you'd apply to a signal which would get rid of high frequencies, high fluctuations. I guess if you apply it to audio, you'd get rid of those like sounds. Hopefully my pop filter here is actually stopping that airflow from being horrible into the mic. But right, if you have that high frequency static um, that you might get, um, a low pass filter would, well, take care of some of that. It would get rid of high frequencies in a signal. And similarly, if we have lots of little random fluctuations in our data, these little stochastic fluctuations, smoothing will smooth those out. And in effect, we're doing the same thing as applying a low pass filter, which would get rid of high frequencies. So there are some connections there. We're not going to get into the details of signals analysis and audio processing and all that stuff, but um, it is good to just be aware that there are these connections out there, especially with respect to the FFT that we talked about in the previous lectures. Typically, you can transform into the Fourier space, into frequency domain, that is. Um, and then you can just cut out, you can apply a transformation that will cut out the high frequencies and then transform back. Or oftentimes you convolve with the correct thing. But again, I'm getting a little bit sidetracked. I don't want to get into all of that today. 
Right. So that's the rough idea of the simple exponential smoother. Now, what I want to do, though, is go a little bit further and talk about the idea of a double exponential smoother. So, right, the, the rough idea, so this is now the next section is going to be double exponential smoother. So roughly the idea is that the simple exponential smoother is just going to smooth things out. And again, I didn't make any assumptions about what X is, if X has any trends in it, or if it's just a stationary time series. If it's just a stationary series, then the simple smoother is just going to kind of dampen those stochastic fluctuations up and down around the mean. Um, but if there's a trend in the data, if we're increasing or decreasing, people often like to use a double exponential smoother. So what is that? Well, um, simply put, what we're going to do now is we're still going to start with the idea that S1 is going to be X1. So we start our smoother at whatever the first data point is. But now we're going to have to define something else, and that something else is going to be B. And B1 is going to be the difference between X2 and X1. So this is like the, the change or slope. And B is kind of loaded notation, right? Because oftentimes we'll use B to correspond to like a slope or something in a linear model. So Right, the idea here is that we would start with this notation where we have um, two different things going on. We have our smoothed time series starts at x1, and we have a change, um, the difference between x2 and x1. And then we define, so this is the like initialization. Then we would define st to be alpha for some alpha of xt. So the same thing as before, we choose an alpha, which is going to tell us how much we're going to smooth. Um, but now what we're going to do is we're going to take 1 minus alpha, and we're going to multiply it by s, s t minus 1 as before. But what we're going to do is we're going to include b t minus 1. So in this case, it's the previous smooth value, but we're adding something else, which is the, um, well, I didn't define what B is going to be, but this is going to be like the smoothed um, slope or change. Uh, yeah, so I should probably tell you what B T is going to be defined as because BT, and this is where it's a double exponential smoother in the sense that BT is also going to have a, um, a uh, exponential smoother type look to it. In this case, we're going to need another parameter, say beta, which is going to be another value between zero and one. I'll write that over here. We need an alpha in zero one and a beta in zero one. Anyway, given that, what we're going to look at is the change in our smoothed value st, st minus 1. Um, and we're going to have 1 minus beta times the previous b, t minus 1. So effectively, the bt's are kind of just like a simple exponential smoothing of the change in our smoothed time series, right? So again, this is... Uh, Maybe a little bit like, okay, we're just going a little one step further down the rabbit hole here. Um, but sometimes you see this referred to as things like trend smoothing, the idea that we have a, um, um, we're, we're considering how is the time series changing from one point to the next. And again, I have not been, I, I'm not an applied statistician who has spent lots of time doing time series analysis, but from reading through textbooks and some papers, I get the sense that people like this approach when there are trends in the data versus the simple exponential smoothing. But 
again, talk to an econometrician if you really want to see how some of these things are applied in practice, um, because that's not my expertise by any means. Now, you can actually take this to something called um, triple exponential smoothing. Um, there's also additive versus multiplicative exponential smoothing. There's a lot of uh, crazy things here. What I want to do is I want to talk specifically about what comes into the R package uh, or the R function Holt Winters, because you'll see that name being thrown around a lot or that hyphenation of two names, presumably, I believe Holt Winters are two different people. Um, though I'm not 100% sure on that, so we should probably uh, double check that. All right, so what I want to do is I want to try to make more sense of these exponential smoothers in the context of things that we're already familiar with, that being the ARIMA process. Because we'll say, fun fact, which is that um, simple exponential smoothing is the ARIMA 0, 1, 1 model. Huh, so that's interesting because on one hand, we had this idea that I just want to have a smooth version of my time series. On the other hand here, I have an ARIMA model, which is sort of modeling the noise process here, or at least modeling my time series um, after taking a first difference as a moving average process. So hmm, let's investigate this further and actually write it out. In this case, if we consider our ARIMA 1, 1 model, what we would find is that we would have the first difference, 1 minus b, applied to the time series xt. Okay. On the other side, we would have 1 plus theta b applied to wt. Okay, so where do we go from there? Well, what we can do is we can split this up and we find out that we have xt is equal to xt minus 1 plus, well, then a couple things here. We're going to have a wt and we're going to have a theta um, wt minus 1. Now, what we're going to get back to is that idea of the innovations algorithm. Remember that the innovations algorithm was telling us way back in our notes. It was saying that what I could do is I could look at these residuals, like I look at the changes um, in my time series to kind of get an estimate of what the white noise should be. Um, the little fluctuations and then use that as a way of doing forecasting. Well, in this case, um, what we're going to do, right, is we're going to note that the, well, we're going to make a note that um, roughly what we're saying here is that the change in um, xt is going to correspond a bit to the white noise process. So if we wanted to do some forecasting and we wanted to say figure out what xt is based on the previous measurements or the previous observations, what we would probably do is say, okay, well, I'm going to use the previous observation xt minus 1. Now, wt, white noise at the current time, is kind of like a stochastic fluctuation. It's unknown, but it's mean 0, so we would not include that. But what we would want to do is try to figure out what the previous white noise WT minus 1 is based on the data, the previous data. And one way to estimate or the white noise, I kind of hate saying that because it feels like I'm saying estimate a, random, a normal random variable, which is just a normal random variable. But um, right, we can kind of think of the white noise here as a residual, the difference between the t minus first data point and the previous prediction of the t minus first data point, right? Okay, so now what happens if we rearrange this? Well, what we end up with is something that's going to be, um, hmm, I think I missed a minus sign somewhere. Yes, I think I want a minus sign because 
ultimately what I want is something that's going to be like one minus theta x t minus one. Um, plus theta x hat t minus one. So what we're kind of doing is saying that the um, the new prediction is going to be a weighted average of the previous prediction and the current observed data point, right? And this is the idea. In this case, um, the role of alpha above, which has not quite fallen off the top of the screen here, is being played by, well, this is the double exponential smoothing, but same idea. The alpha here is being um, is being replaced by a one minus theta. So where in the world did my minus sign go? All right, so the problem that I ran into here is that I realized that theta actually could be positive or negative. So I was... Um, outthinking myself. If I just follow the equation on this line um, and put it together, what I would have is one plus theta and then a minus here, which looks a little weird, but if theta is negative, then we get exactly what I want, which is basically um, four theta equal to minus, I guess in this case, one or alpha minus one. what we would end up with is something like x hat t is going to be um, alpha x t minus one plus one minus alpha x hat t minus one. Where here x hat t would be our prediction um, and x would be the observed value. So in a sense, what we're doing the exact same thing, we're predicting um, the next point based on a weighted average of the previous prediction and the current value. So while we introduce simple exponential smoothing as just a way to smooth out our data, it actually does have context as an ARIMA model, and thus we can use it for things like forecasting and whatnot and ask questions like, okay, how well does this model fit the data? What's our forecasting accuracy? Things of that nature. Now, um, I believe we can actually do the same thing for the double exponential smoothing, sometimes called linear exponential smoothing. One thing, actually, I should probably put that in here. As I mentioned, there's a lot of different terminology. Sometimes you'll see this called linear exponential smoothing or double exponential smoothing. Anyway, let's see if we can sort that one out without um, running into a little bit of trouble with all of the uh, the term the terms. So. I guess. Fun fact number two. Let's try the ARIMA zero two one model and see if I don't get lost with all of the parameters. All right, so the ARIMA two two model here um, is going to look something like what it's going to be our one minus b applied to xt and that's going to be one minor plus theta one b plus theta two b squared applied to wt now if we put all this together as we did before we end up with an xt is equal to x t minus one and then we're going to have a big string of white noises we're going to have a Oh, I forgot to square this. I knew I did something wrong there. Yeah, we have to apply this twice um, because we're doing a second difference. Otherwise, yeah, that's not going to be as interesting. In this case, we would have a minus two um, x t minus one plus x t minus two. And on the other side, we're going to end up with what? A wt a theta 1 wt minus 1 and a theta 2 wt minus 2. Okay so if we rearrange these terms again what we end up with is something that's going to look like 2 x t minus 1 plus x t minus or minus sorry got to get these minus signs right they are killers 
Anyway, we get something that looks like this. Now, if we use the same minus two, if we use the same thought process as above, what we can do is we can replace the W's with differences between our predicted and our forecasted or our observed and our forecasted values for XT. So here, if I'm, let's say, hat, so if I want to predict XT or I want to forecast it, right, what I can do is I can use the previous two data points. The WT gets replaced with zero just because, again, we don't have any information at what's happening at time t. I'm assuming I don't have the data point xt um, in this example, um, but we have the previous data points. Now for wt minus 1, however, we can try to estimate that by looking at the difference between xt minus 1 and x t minus 1 hat. Um, and similarly, we can do the same thing over here. We can have an x t minus 2 and an x t minus 2 hat. Cool. Okay, so what happens when we put all of this together? Well, the first thing we're going to get is we're going to get, let's see if we can keep track of everything here. We should get a... 2 plus theta 1 x t minus 1 and then we're going to have a minus theta 1 x hat t minus 1 and then we're also going to have an x let's see if we can get this a minus okay now we're going to have a theta 2 minus 1 x t minus 2 and a well i guess i can just subtract this whole thing minus 1 minus theta 2 um minus theta 2 x hat t minus 2 Right, I think that should be everything we need. Cool, and in fact, maybe it would be better to um, have written this first term here in terms of x t minus one plus the um, smoothed version x t minus one minus theta one x hat t minus one and then the rest of this is kind of like minus one minus theta two x t minus two plus since i factored out that minus sign okay so we have something that looks like that um, where do we go from there all right so this one's a little bit harder to interpret but what we can do is we can notice that what we effectively have is we have the previous data point x t minus one and then we have a difference of these two simple exponential smoothed values now it's not exactly like that because we have to consider that x hat is being smoothed by this entire process but roughly it gives you an idea of what's happening here um, in the sense that we could have something like an alpha one x t minus one minus alpha or one minus alpha one sorry plus one minus alpha one x hat t minus one um and over on this other side we could have something like a alpha two x t minus two plus one minus alpha two x t minus two hat um so you kind of get the idea of how we are um kind of like iterating this smoothing method here. So yeah, I think the equations are a little bit harder to interpret in this case, um, but you can kind of get a sense about what's going on. Now, 
If we look at the actual um, Holt Winters method in the R code, you can find that it'll tell you exactly what it's going to do. So what I'm going to write this out before we actually apply this in uh, practice. So in R, we have Holt Winters, um, which is just in the general stats package, the default stats package. And you can do either an additive or a multiplicative Holt Winters, um, I guess, forecasting. Um, so what does that look like? Well, it gives you the formula that it does right in there, but uh, it can be a little bit confusing if you um, first, uh, well, when you first stare at it. So I thought we could write it out here um, initially. All right, so let's look at additive Holt Winters in R, which is going to also have a, um, well, a kind of like a mean, a linear piece, and a seasonal piece attached to it. I didn't write this out before, but you can we'll, we'll look at the equation to try to make sense of what's going on. So in the sense of the R code, what it tells you is that it's going to predict a Y hat at time T plus H, so H step ahead forecast. What is it going to give you? Well, it's going to make that as a combination of AT, plus h times bt um, plus s. Now my notation is going to change a little bit from above where I was using s as a smooth time series. s here is going to be the seasonal, seasonal um, bit that has some type of periodicity to it. So here we're going to do a t minus p plus 1 plus, and then they're going to have an h minus 1 mod p, which is kind of annoying to look at. Um, effectively, what it's saying is that every h, I mean, the rest of this is kind of um, annoying, but it's effectively just saying period p um, so that every time h goes p steps, we kind of start over again. Um, so the Holt Winters method of forecasting and modeling and forecasting here is going to use an equation that looks like this. But then it asks the question, well, what in the world are AT, BT, and ST? So here we have AT, and this is going to be our um, smoothed, um, well, it's going to look a lot like the, um, like the double exponential smoother, but there's going to be a uh, there's going to be a seasonal component here. So what it's going to be is it's going to be alpha, which is going to be some parameter that we can choose or try to let the algorithm select. Um, and it's going to be yt, which is our observed. Oh, yeah, I'm using yt because they're using yt. But um, I'm going to switch back to xt just because that's the notation we've been using for the whole course. xt is our time series. Now. We have the present, the most recent present value xt, or the teeth value, minus the seasonal bit. And the seasonal bit here is going to be st minus p. So it's like saying I go back one season to see what the change is, right? That's intuitively what's going on here. This is kind of like the present. And this is the last season. So if we have monthly data and we have an annual season, it's like saying, OK, I have my observation for January 2021. I can go back and use my seasonal, I guess, smoothed value from January 2020 and look at the difference. Anyway, we're going to have that difference in here. And we're also going to have a one plus, not plus, a one. Come on, R or Microsoft, a1 minus uh, the previous value, a t minus 1 plus b t minus 1. OK, so what is that doing? Well, what it's doing here is it's saying that we're going to have some type of a a t is basically like our smooth mean in some sense. Um, we're looking at how x t changed from the previous seasonal bit. Um, and weighting that at alpha. 
And then for one minus alpha, we're going to have the previous AT value plus the change. And BT is going to be like the slope or the smoothed change or trend parameter um, or series, I guess. Anyway, for BT, we're going to have something that's going to look like beta. And then we're going to have an AT minus AT minus one. So what we're doing here, right, is we're saying we're taking the current AT and yesterday's AT and looking at the difference, how much did it change and multiplying that by some weight beta. The other bit then becomes one minus beta times the previous measurement B T minus one. So again, I'm not expecting you to kind of absorb all of the equations here, but just to see the form of the equation, try not to get too lost in all of the notation, but just the form is all the same. A weighted combination of some change like the AT minus AT minus one and the previous observation, um, BT minus one or the previous point. Lastly, um, this smoothing method also includes a seasonal bit, which is going to be ST. And we're going to have a new, a new parameter gamma, which is going to be between zero and one. And we're going to look at YT minus AT. So this is kind of like saying how much is Y fluctuating above like the smoothed average. Um, and then we're going to have a one minus gamma times the previous seasonal component. So again, it's kind of hard to interpret, but this is roughly what's going on. And this is the idea of a um, additive Holt-Winters um, predictor. If we're going to do it multiplicatively, I think things change a little bit. I'm not going to write it all out because it's just going to be a bunch of messy formula, um, but you can find it in the R documentation if you want to see how the formula changed in the multiplicative case. Um, but more interestingly, what we're actually going to do is try to work with this model with real data and just get a sense of what's going on because i know this is the end of the course and um, we're going to just aim to increase our repertoire of time series tools so that we have some ideas in our head if we want to try something else beyond just using um, arima which was the main function we used to fit and predict time series models in this course all right, and we're back in our studio. Uh, it turns out I forgot to actually record my screen because, um, well, it's been a long term and uh, we're almost there now, but um, that's why there's all this junk up on the screen already. Um, but what I did was um, I tried to load in the data set of AB of Alberta COVID cases, the data set that you've looked at in this course um, throughout the assignments. And what we see is that, you know, we have that big first wave spike. It drops down at by, I think, the end of April, kind of into May. Um, and then it starts to slowly increase as we move throughout last summer. This is all 2020. Um, and what we wanted to do, um, after you can see all my random code here that I already ran, is I want to try to use Holt Winters on it. So if we go back to what Holt Winters function is, now this exists in the stats package in R the default one. What it allows us to do is to plug in our time series X as well as our parameters alpha, beta, and gamma here. Again, alpha is going to be the overall kind of like filtering. Beta is going to be more for the trend. Um, and gamma is going to be the seasonal parameter. These are all going to be values between zero and one. Um, and then there's a couple other things that you can do about starting values and whatnot. You actually don't have to set any of these. You can let the algorithm decide it for you. So here's the, the crazy formulation of this. We're going to ignore the seasonal part um, because, well, we don't have any seasonality in this um, data set. In fact, um, I think I tried accidentally running it that way because I didn't tell it to not fit a seasonal part and it got mad at me and said there's... Um, the period is uh, not a non-existent here, so we don't want to deal, have a seasonal um, component. Um, but I also wanted to point out that there are two ways you can fit this. There's an additive model, which is the one we're going to try. There's also this multiplicative one. Um, if 
that's something of interest. I'm not going to get into all the details on that, but you can quickly see that it looks very similar, but some of the formulation has changed with how the seasonal component comes in and how you compute AT and BT. And well, BT looks, I think, the same, but at least how you compute AT and whatnot um, as well. Now, um, one thing to note with this function is that if you don't tell it what alpha or beta or gamma value to use, it's just going to try to optimize them all based on the one step ahead prediction error, which is kind of neat. It basically says, I'm going to try a bunch of different alphas and betas and whatever um, in order to try to optimize the prediction error. So what happens when you do that? Well, I already did it, but we will um, do it again so you can see it live. Right. What I can do here is I can go to my Holt Winters function and I'm going to run it on the AB Alberta um, COVID cases data set. Again, it looks something like that. Uh, I'm going to say gamma is equal to false, which basically says don't include that seasonal um, component in the model. And what I get is something that looks like this. So I get my alpha and my beta out here beta is really small which is kind of saying like the i guess in this case right if alpha is large alpha in this case is large then the larger alpha is the more that we just rely on the previous observation to predict the next so alpha equal to one is kind of like the random walk case where it's like it could go up or down but the best we got is just use the previous observation um, meanwhile, here we have um, beta. Beta is quite small, so in that case, we're actually relying on some like smoother trend. Um, and we have some coefficients here um, for like a uh, mean and intercept, which don't really, I think, well, yeah, roughly. Anyway, um, what does this look like? Well, if we actually plot this forecast, we get something that looks like that, which almost has like this double vision look to it. Like, am I seeing that correctly? I kind of see it looks a little bit blurry. Um, remember that alpha is quite large. And if alpha is quite large, we're going to be using the previous measurement to predict the next measurement. So what I can do is I can actually go back here and manually choose alpha equal to one and beta non-existent. And what that's going to do is it's going to basically say, I'm going to predict the next value based on the previous value and you take your whole time series and you shift it with no actual smoothing. On the other hand, if I set alpha equal to 0.1, so now I'm going to have a very, this is a simple exponential smoother um, and I get something that looks like that, right? where it's trying to use the previous values to predict the trend through this simple exponential smoothing. Now, it's not really a great fit, right? You get this, um, you can see pretty quickly that it's um, it's kind of lagging behind. Lagging is kind of a loaded term in time series, but it's, it's falling behind in what it's supposed to be doing. The actual cases are dropping down, and it's very slow to catch up to it. Mainly because, again, if I have alpha close to zero, there's a lot of inertia built into this. If I were to set beta here, let's try something like alpha is equal to one half and um, let's include beta equal to one half to see, oh, it's going to get mad at me. Okay, let's try beta smaller. Nope, it's going to still get mad at me. Well, that's always good. Oh, yeah, I'm just being silly here. I already had beta in here and R is just like, what are you doing? You're giving me two betas. I don't want two betas. So let's see what happens if we include both beta at one half and alpha equal to one half. Well, now it actually is kind of a little bit better in the sense that it um, follows the time series a little bit more closely. Um, again, we're not optimizing the one step ahead prediction error that was done um, by those other choices of parameter where alpha is large and beta is quite small. In contrast, we can do the exact same thing um, if I get rid of this, but keep gamma equal to false. For the A-B tests, that is, the number of COVID tests performed. Now, before we look at the results, we should look at what the actual data says. In this case, we see an increasing linear trend. Um, roughly, I should say, increasing linear trend. It's almost like there's a little bit of a change point in here um, when we move out of the first wave um, and then move into the summer. 
when things calm down, calmed down a bit. Um, but in this case, um, we get a smaller alpha actually. Um, so a little bit more inertia in the system and beta still is, I guess, quite small. Um, in this case, if I were to plot this model, um, yeah, it's gonna look the same, which is kind of like the same series slightly offset. Remember what we're basically doing here is we're trying to predict the next guy based on the previous guy, but adding in some exponential smoothing. Um, so you can have a lot of fun just playing with this. I mean, I think sometimes the best way to learn about methods in statistics is just to experiment, just to kind of see what happens when you um, apply these methods. Um, right, so then the other thing I wanted to talk about is that there's another function called ETS, with, which exists in the forecast package. Now, if you read some of the documentation on ETS, you'll see the author saying that you should be using this function and not Holt Winters because this one is um, better. I guess I can take his word for it. Um, I haven't actually used either of these too much, but you can see that the same ideas occur. We have an alpha, we have a beta, we have a gamma. We have something called damped here, which is for dampened time series, something that we didn't talk about, but um, that's another thing. There's also this crazy model argument here. And here for the model argument, what you have to do is you have to put in an A, an M, or a Z, um, or I guess um, an N, an A, an M, or a Z, where what you get is you get additive, multiplicative, and Z is automatic. And then, um, Similarly, for the um, second one is going to be for the um, the trend type. Um, so I guess here, yeah, they have N now included, which is no trend. So if you just want to do simple exponential smoothing and the same thing for the seasonal component. So it looks kind of annoying, but it's actually quite nice in the sense that you can run this almost automatically. And they give you some examples. Like if you type in ANN, you're saying do simple exponential smoothing. Um, there we go. Um, or you can have MAM, which is the multiplicative Holt Winters method with, I guess this, yeah, multiplicative seasonal bit here. Um, oh no, the additive bit, there's an additive. Yeah. So it has an additive, um, bit for the trend. Yeah. So basically you can try lots of different things. The neat thing is that it'll just pick one for you. So I haven't actually run this yet, which is always fun to see what's going to happen live. It's not technically live, is it, since I'm pre-recording this. So if it goes horribly, I'll just edit it out. But um, it could be fun to see what happens um, if I just give it the Alberta cases um, time series. All right, so what did it tell us? Well, we get some interesting things here. It comes up with an MAN, a man model, I guess. Uh, this is for the uh, multiplicative errors and additive trend and no seasonal component as we saw before it estimates an alpha and a beta parameter remember these things even though we didn't write down all the equations these things are the smoothing well it says right there they're the smoothing parameters um the larger the value the less smooth the smaller the value the more smooth um it also does some states-based stuff that we're not going to talk about, and it gives us some AIC, um, which is always kind of nice to have that included in here. So hopefully it's going to have a built-in plot function for us. Yeah, there we go. And in this case, we actually get an entire decomposition with the so-called level and slope. So it takes our Alberta um, COVID cases and it breaks it into two pieces, the first being the... Um, um, kind of like the smoothed, I guess, air or something, how it's fluctuating up and down. And then we have this kind of trend as well. I guess the fact that it's increasing a bit and then not as much. So it's a, you know, you can kind of stare at this for a little bit to try to make some sense about what's going on here, right? Um, but it is kind of neat that you have this entire other method of, um, of uh, modeling that we can use. We can do this the same thing to the A-B tests and we can look at it to see what we get out. It also picks the uh, man model um, with actually fairly similar choices of parameters there. And we can plot that just to see what we get. 
And yeah, you kind of get this sense of um, what's happening here <clears throat> with respect to like the AT and the BT series, smooth series on top of the actual observations. But ultimately, you might want to ask yourself, is one of these better than what we already did with Arima or not, right? Well, we could actually sort that out because we can use the accuracy function um, to test the forecasting accuracy of these methods. So let's do a little throwdown and see which method works better, right? What we can do is we can fit an MD auto, which I'm going to use auto Arima because I'm too lazy to pick a better one. <laughs> uh, we'll use auto Arima to decide what the best series is for AB cases. And we have md.auto, which is going to be an AR11 model. In contrast, we can do MDETS as I did before. In this case, we're going to apply the ETS method to the AB cases. Um, and now we have two different methods. So let's look at the forecast accuracy. MD auto is going to give us a root mean squared error of 26.8, whereas ETS is going to give us, oh, a slightly higher root mean squared error, sadly. Um, and I guess mean absolute error as well. And these other ones, um, there's way too many forecasting errors. They really bug me that there's so many of them, but I guess everybody has their own favorite. Anyway, it looks like in this case, the Arima 1.1 has outperformed our friend, uh, our new friend ETS. But what happens in the case of the uh, tests? Now, I haven't actually run this. I'm just doing this on the fly. Um, so we're gonna find out together or you'll find out once you actually watch this video and I compile it and upload it. Um, regardless, we can get our A-B tests. The auto ARIMA tells us that it should be an ARIMA 111 model. In contrast, if we jump back to ETS, what do we get if I can type this correctly? Well, let's go back to accuracy and find out. In this case, our root mean squared error is, well, quite big. It just, I mean, it's all relative, right, to the data. In this case, we have an 874.9. For ETS, we have a, oh, 905. Oh, oh and the mean absolute error is a 666, which is, a, I guess, ominous. Regardless, it looks like in this case, um, the auto ARIMA is picking a better model than ETS is with respect to forecasting error, at least the mean squared error and the mean absolute error. Um, so it does just give you an idea that there are other methods out there for fitting time series models, doing prediction. Um, this idea of both Holt Winters and exponential smoothing is another aspect. There are a lot of connections to ARIMA, um, as I mentioned in the notes, right? Um, sometimes you'll see them just say IMA for an integrated moving average model, um, but that becomes very popular as well. Um, so right, what's the best way to uh, model your data? Well, you have to try other things. And I would also encourage you not to just rely on the defaults here, the auto ARIMAs and ETS automatically selecting a model for you, um, because ultimately you want to consider the data set you have and what type of models might be good to fit it and to do and to use for um, forecasting and whatnot. It can be a little dangerous when you let the algorithm just sort of decide which model is the best for you. Um, now, that being said, that's what I did right here for um, um, testing purposes. But um, going forward, it's always good to try multiple models out on your data just to see what happens because AIC, BIC, they might give you different answers. Um, and they also giving working with respect to prediction error would might give you another answer as well. Um, so again, all models are wrong. Some are useful as Fox said, and every single person at every statistics conference has said as well. So I figured I might as well jump on the bandwagon and uh, say it here before we end this course.
right? So this was a bit of a shorter lecture, but this is all that I really wanted to talk about for today, just to give you a taste of other methods that are out there in time series. Going forward, we have one more bonus lecture left, so we're not quite done yet. So if you want to learn a little bit more about a different method, tune into the next lecture, um, and then we will slowly enter the uh, end and do some review of what we talked about throughout this entire um, lecture course before we conclude this video lecture series. Right, so I will see you in the next lecture.